bringing everyone in as welcome welcome everyone as you can see this is a slightly different format than you may be accustomed to because we are lucky to have certain esteemed people in the room with us so i'm just gonna give a few minutes for everybody to join in whilst we prepare for the first half of this well not even half the first 20 or so minutes of this event and let me acknowledge the presence of well, two ambassadors um ambassador wayne mccook who is the assistant deputy assistant secretary general uh at caricom secretariat responsible for the caricom single market and his uh predecessor trade single market and trade thank you and his predecessor was the director of the Office of Trade Negotiations in the CARICOM Secretariat and our awardee, Ambassador Gail Matherin. Let me also recognize uh, the presence of uh, many persons from the CARICOM Secretariat who work currently in that division of the CARICOM Single Market and Trade Division, as well as um, other persons from the SRC staff. So welcome everyone here and wonderful to have you all. And obviously, well, lovely to have those of you who are joining us online. So my name is Dr. Jani Remy, and I am the current director of the Sridhar Ramphal Center, the SRC. And I want to welcome you to this, our early International Women's Day event. It doesn't happen until the 8th of March, but we wanted to get ahead of everyone else. Um, under the theme, of, of the title of this webinar is Empowering Women Entrepreneurs in CARICOM with a special focus on innovation and digitization given this year's theme of International Women's Day of Digital Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. As you may well know, women and trade is a crucial discussion that the world is now having, especially the trade world. And it does help that we have female heads of all of the major trade organizations in Geneva, the World Trade Organization, UNCTAD, as well as the ITC. But before I introduce our panelists for that discussion and go to that uh, overall panel uh, discussion, I wanted to start with the highlight perhaps um, of this uh, of today's event, which is the award of the SRC this year, our Women in Trade Award, um, that is going to a head of a regional, former head of a regional organization. At least that was one of the accolades. As we have advertised in the flyer, our awardee for the prestigious SRC Women in Trade Award this year goes to Ambassador Gail Matherin, former head of CARICOM's Office of Trade Negotiator and a former SRC advisory board member, uh, and I dare say a colleague and a friend in trade. This is the second time that the SRC is awarding a deserving honoree to a Caribbean woman who has provided stellar service to the region in the field of trade, and in a sense has trailblazed and distinguished herself, whether through example, mentorship, technical expertise, or prowess in this field. Our first awardee, you may remember, was Dame Billy Miller, who was the inaugural recipient of the award. I don't want to spend too much time reciting her, her various accolades, and I will instead pass the floor over to Ambassador Wayne McCook, who, as I introduced, is the Assistant Secretary General of the CARICOM Single Market and Trade, Division of the CARICOM Secretariat and a member of our SRC Advisory Board to move the tribute. So Ambassador Wayne McCook, over to you. Thank 
Good morning, uh, colleagues, and thank you very much for that uh, introduction, uh, <clears throat> Jenny. I'm really honored to have been asked to undertake this uh, next activity. I will not call it a task, because tasks imply a significant effort. This, for me, was effortless. Uh, to pay tribute to a colleague, a friend, an exemplar uh, in the Jamaican and Caribbean diplomatic circles. Gail is a quintessential Caribbean woman and a trade champion. This award could have been designed around her CV, and perhaps it is. Gail embodies the Caribbean spirit in her soca reggae sensibilities, and yes, her DNA. Her mother, the late Lucille Matherin Mayer, an icon of Jamaican and Caribbean diplomacy and academic thought, blazed her own trail as Gail has done in different fields of international endeavor. I should mention, of course, that perhaps uh, Ambassador Mayer was one of the first gender champions of the region. Gail is as much a daughter of Jamaica, St. Lucia, of Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, pieces of Caribbean soil on which she was born. She lived, she worked, played mass, and rallied around the West Indies cricket team, as she is of every other Caribbean member state to which she devoted decades of her life's work. The Caribbean, its integration, its progress, its development, its survival has been Gail's cause. She chose a path of service to her country and the Caribbean community because for Gail, Caribbean integration was never an idealistic pursuit or an academic theory. She regarded it as a foundation on which real progress and development of the region for the benefit of the people of the region must be built. Gail understood that the success of any regional integration project depends on a strong internal and external trade regime. She's in good company in this conviction, as this was the approach embraced by the architects of modern Caribbean integration. They established CARIFTA as the foundation on which CARICOM has been built. The community which celebrates its golden anniversary this year continues as the longest surviving integration movement in the developing world. This approach was further entrenched in the revised Treaty of Chagaramas establishing the Caribbean community and the CSME. Gail chose to make diplomacy her profession and trade her specialty. She was at the center of the most significant trade initiatives affecting our region in the last several decades and helped to shape and define much of the Caribbean's external trade policy as a national diplomat and head of the Office of Trade Negotiations. Gail's contribution to the Caribbean community's external trade negotiations predated her appointment as Director General of the Office of Trade Negotiations. She was a member of CARICOM's College of Negotiators for the Free Trade Area of the Americas, established by the Caribbean Regional Negotiating Machinery. She participated as a Vice Minister in these negotiations and served in a technical advisory role on market access issues. She was indeed a leading voice for CARICOM in trade negotiating committee meetings and contributed to many of the CARICOM's negotiating successes in that arena. Gail was chosen to be the first head of the CARICOM Office of Trade Negotiations. This office was established based on a decision by the Conference of Heads of Government to incorporate functions of the former CRNM into the CARICOM Secretariat. They were wise in that decision, in appointing Gail to head the office at its outset, because Gail quickly demonstrated the value of her experience and diplomatic acumen in responding to the political sensitivities 
and the technical complexities confronting the region in trade negotiations and trade policy. As CARICOM chief negotiator in the negotiations with Canada for a trade and development agreement, she expertly guided the community's engagement through seven rounds of negotiations in which a significant number of texts were advanced. Her work has laid a solid foundation for future engagement on trade arrangements with our very important trading partners. Gail successfully oversaw the critical technical engagements for the rolling over of the obligations of the United Kingdom and Cariforum states from the Cariforum EU EPA into an equivalent agreement. The success of this effort enabled the seamless transition to the new arrangement, which must not be taken for granted. Under Gail's guidance, the Office of Trade Negotiations expanded the use of its in-house expertise for capacity building at the national level, while maintaining the high standard of, standard of work on trade policy and negotiations, which remained at the center of the OTN's mandate. Gail navigated the OTN through difficult and challenging times with a grace and aplomb that has been her hallmark throughout her career. Earning the respect of her colleagues and the leadership of the community, her peers and counterparts throughout her term in office. Her contributions have been celebrated far and wide by the international trade community, regional leaders, and her former colleagues in CARICOM, especially the CRNM OTM. I must share some of these sentiments in which the community to which she devoted her life's work expresses its appreciation for her service to our region. Our Secretary General in her commendation recognizes Gail as an ex excellent example of service to the Caribbean community, ensuring the best results for the people of the community from her endeavors. Sir Sridhar Ramfer, Doyen of Caribbean Trade and Diplomacy, extended congratulations to Gail for her richly deserved award in recognition of her stellar contributions. The Premier of Montserrat, Honorable Easton Taylor Farrell, presiding as Chair of COTED at a session in which the region's trade leaders paid tribute to Gail's work, celebrated Gail's broad, direct, broad depth of her knowledge, experience, and guidance as he thanked Gail for her service. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade of Jamaica, the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, recognized Ambassador Matherin as a distinguished Jamaican who had blazed a trail on the international stage, serving Jamaica with distinction in various capacities as ambassador and finally as head of the Jamaican Foreign Service before moving to the CARICOM Office of Trade Negotiations, where the region truly benefited from her wealth of knowledge in an area for which the region is in critical need, raising the bar of excellence in our trade negotiations. Ministers and heads of delegations lauded Gail's professionalism and complete grasp of the issues. Her leadership, humility, sanguinity, and her innovative solutions to negotiation dead deadlocks. They recalled her sober and wise counsel and recognized her as a public service servant in the best traditions of our region, while emphasizing that the region had benefited from her selfless dedication to CARICOM, Jamaica, and the region as a whole. They declared, we have all been inspired by her commitment to excellence, her enormous capabilities, her stellar engagements in the arena of trade negotiations and the integration process. They stressed, as I do, we are absolutely proud of the work that Gail has done on behalf of the peoples of the Caribbean. And I join the SRC in commending my colleague and friend Gail on the award and the conferment of this great honor. Gail. Thank you, we should probably um, you would join me as board member of the SRC and 
as her immediate successor. Um, in... And she was my previous boss. Oh, so it's all <laughs> coming full circle. Um, on behalf of the SRC, the board, as well as the management and staff, and the broader community, which I dare say I represent in conferring this award of trade um, across the region, it is my pleasure and honor to be able to bestow you with this very, very modest award and gratitude for the service you have rendered the region and the world in the fee and your country in the field of international trade. Congratulations. Um, very well deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And without putting the ambassador, thank you so thank you, much. These were excellent, excellent remarks. And I understand that they were to have been accompanied by a video, but I think it would have been a little too overwhelming for ambassador. <laughs> so what we will do is we, oh, please, please, Clavel, a member of our staff will present you. I forgot about the flowers with these flowers. Thank you very much um, to accompany your award. Thank you. You're very welcome. And just to say that, yes, the video we will upload onto our website and thank the OTN, the SS, CSM, CSTMT, oh my goodness, uh, for preparing that video, which we will make available after we allow the ambassador to view it in private. Thank you. <laughs> so I know you are overcome, I can see. And if you wanted to say any words, um, this would be the opportunity. Thank you, Johnny. Dr. Reverend Director of the Shuda Lanka Center. Yes, I, I had planned to say a few words, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, 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 to do that. Um, First of all, let me, let me thank the center for, for what is really a great honor. Um, yes, a great honor. Um, the center has been a part of our trade policy apparatus for, for a number of years. And I'm so pleased to see that it is continuing that tradition and in fact expanding its reach. Um, so it's not only ensuring that professionals are trained, but you're moving into research, into policy advice. Um, and, and that's that's something that I think is to be commended. And um, I am particularly grateful again to the center, to you and to the advisory board for, for this honor today. Um, to my colleague, friend, Wayne, thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciated your words. Um, and I'm sure you have a copy that you will allow me <laughs> to keep. I, I'm not sure that I totally recognize myself, but um, I, I do thank you. I do really, really thank you. I am also very, very pleased that those who made any success that we had at the regional level possible uh, in the room today, because you can't do it without. None of this can, is possible without a team. And the team is all, most of them are all here. Um, it's, it's so good to see you all. I had an opportunity to thank you publicly at the Coated, but I just want to say thank you again. It, it, it just would not have been possible. This is a team of dedicated, enthusiastic, um, expert, um, collaborators, friends, we went through some ups and downs, but I'm so glad to see that you're still at the, at the, on the front line under the guidance of me. I just wanted to say a few words about the region because I think we are going through difficult times today globally and we don't really know what's going to be the end result. And therefore, I would just like to urge that those of you who believe 
in a united CARICOM. Those of you who believe, in fact, in a united Caribbean, because I do think that there is room for us to widen our reach within the region. I just urge you to, to, to continue your commitment and dedication. You really don't know what the current uh, global environment is going to throw up for us. We're going through a difficult time globally. I think I saw a headline last night that was very disturbing that the G7 or the G20 meeting ended with some um, in some turmoil. That's not a, a very encouraging sign going forward. And therefore, I think it's very important for us in the region to pull together. My colleague from the single market, my former colleague from the single market, mm -hmm. but also a friend is here in the room. Um, I know that he, under the guidance of Wayne, uh, battling to try and get the single market moving forward. We have to continue that battle. And we have to continue the, the, the battle to have our voices heard in the international trade scene, um, international trade environment. Um, it's, uh, it's our future, it's our existence. Uh, our future, our existence depends on our and your continued advocacy and hard work. I hope you will forgive me for just um, taking this opportunity to recognize. Um, we talk about to recognize someone who I think was so important in the development of CARICOM's trade policy, and dare I say, developing country trade policy. I just want to remember um, the contribution of Ambassador Dr. Richard Bernal, who talked today the lexicon, the trade lexicon, very um, easily talks about small economies, small vulnerable economies, but there was a time when there was a hell of a fight to get that concept recognized. Um, and Dr. Bernal, Ambassador Bernal, led that battle. Um, and I had the privilege um, of seeing some of that close up. And I just want to pay respect to his memory and to ask that we all commit ourselves to continuing that battle to get small vulnerable economies um, such as ours recognized and, and fully accepted in the, in the global um, the rules system and in the global environment. And there are signs of encouragement. We only need to look at what the IMF and the World Bank are now seeing about small vulnerable economies. 20 years ago, that would not have been possible. So I just want to pay respect to his memory and to trust that you all will keep the battle going. But Jean, even closing, you gave me five minutes. I think I've been here for longer. Thank you so much. This really is a great honor and I shall cherish this moment. I shall really cherish this moment. Thank you. Ambassador, these were wonderful, very heartfelt words. I think sometimes it's good to stop and pay tribute to those on whose shoulders we stand, not just yours, but as gracious as you were to recognize the contribution of the stalwarts as well. So Shrida, you mentioned, um, Billy Miller, Ambassador Bernal, Henry Gill, Norman Gervin, all of those great persons who have preceded us and helped to pave the way for our trade policy. And as you said, what you did about the small and vulnerable economies, we are still wondering and thinking, how are we going to pay tribute to Ambassador Bernal through the work of the center? And an idea just popped into my head, which is small but Talawa, maybe a small but Talawa uh, conference that those from the region and Jamaica would understand it would pay tribute to the Jamaican origins of the man, but also how much he has pushed through that agenda um, in a very Caribbean quintessential way. So thank you for the reminder. Um, and thank you to all of you who are here, but I'll, I'll, I'm hoping you're staying for the rest of the 
uh, the event. I know, Ambassador, if you would like to sit at the table with me for that event, you're welcome to. But if you wanted to also um, sit anywhere else, that's you're also welcome to. Um, but this brings to a close our uh, the first half um, or the first third of our event. Um, and I'm a bit teary because of uh, everything that was shared. But as I said, good sometimes to stop and, and pay tribute. So thank you very much, ambassadors, for uh, assisting us with the event, first half of the event. Let me now turn to the next segment of today's event, Empowering Women Entrepreneurs in CARICOM. And I'm now so pleased to introduce our guest panelists, who I will introduce as they appear. Um, in the in, in, in giving their remarks and I've asked each of them to say a few words, maybe no more than 10 minutes of what they're doing in their respective fields under the theme of empowering entrepreneurs. But before I turn to them, let me just say that a very basic issue that we are confronting, those of us who are studying this intersection of trade and women, uh, it's just figuring out who are these female entrepreneurs across the region? Who are they? What sectors do they occupy? What do they trade? What are their battles? What are their obstacles? And ultimately, how can we use trade policy as a vehicle for advancing their interests and enabling them through trade agreements, but more broadly through the macro uh, economic policies that at the regional and domestic levels uh, we set. Many people ask the question of what the trade agenda has to do with women entrepreneurship. And I would just say that there are some more progressive agreements out there throughout the world that try very hard to intersect trade agreements and provisions and economic empowerment of women. So a lot of North American country, um, so the North American countries, for instance, have negotiated agreements that relate to women's access to productive resources, markets and technology, skill development, participation in economic growth, for instance. And I would also note that that's not just happening in the North, the global North, but also in Africa, where gender explicit trade provisions have found their way into proposed protocols for women and trade, which look at enhancing women's access to resources, promoting female entrepreneurship, and female representation in both political and decision-making uh, areas and corridors. So the question for us in this region is to think really creatively, systemically about how we can better use our trade policies to seize on and advance women's issues without the backlash resort that we often face of advancing women at the expense of other concerns. I think that's a very genuine question that we have to tackle. I'm really proud to say that the SRC is working steadily to look at these issues. And I'm hoping that by the end of the year, we will have some major work I'm also aware as a member of the board of the Caribbean Women in Trade Association that this is also work that we are looking at um, under, the, under that um, initiative. And our launch, by the way, is in May this year in Curacao. I had to get that plug. But one of the things that we would be looking at as a board is trying to, as an interim board, is trying to advance that work. Let me move really swiftly now to um, our panelists. And a lot of the, the work that is now being done in uh, entrepreneurship and trade and entrepreneurship especially has been commissioned by Compete Caribbean actually. Um, and work I'm proud to say of the university uh, researcher, Jonathan Lashley, Catherine Smith and Luane, Mr. Luane, a recent paper on marginalization and gender tracking the experiences of Caribbean women entrepreneurs from 2015 to 2018 um, that was published by the um, IDB and Compete Caribbean in 2022. 
um, has kind of uh, pioneered some of the thinking of what are the problems that women entrepreneurs face. And I know that the Caribbean Development Bank, Caribbean Export, ITC, and others in the region, UN Women, also are looking to engage on some of these questions. And this is why we have this wonderful panel of Fembo here, as well as somebody who may not be in the trade discussions at the political level, but who is actually working in the trenches. Um, so let me start by first of all introducing Dr. Sylvia Donna to provide her perspectives as a private sector lead specialist at Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division of the IBB and Key Caribbean's Executive Director since 2012 to provide some perspectives about what her project is doing and what are the areas that they are seeing that Caribbean women entrepreneurs are confronting. So over to you. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Donard, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice, for having invited me to this event. And I am all protocols observed to start with. And I am so happy to be here also with, um, you know, to have seen the tribute to Ambassador Matherin, who is an inspiration and a role model in the Caribbean and, and overseas, no? Uh, so um, what, what I'm going to talk about, what Janice asked me to talk about was uh, what are the characteristics of women-owned firms in the Caribbean? To give a little bit of a summary of the paper of Lashley et al. on the constraints that uh, women-owned businesses face. Uh, and to give a little bit of like the flavor of what we found in terms of use of technology, innovation behaviors, uh, and gender patterns, okay? Um, I wanted to say that this res what I'm going to share with you today comes from different strands of research that we've conducted through the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility. Uh, just a plug to the donors because this is made possible by the contributions of the IDB, the United Kingdom's Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, the Caribbean Development Bank, and the Government of Canada. And this body of research is really composed of like two different strands, if you will. One is a data that we've generated three times, and it's data at the enterprise level. We've generated it in 2011, 2014, and 2020 in the midst of the pandemic in 13 countries, 2,000 businesses every time, and the data is representative of formal businesses that are more than five employees, okay? Non-agricultural. Um, so that those, there you can see maybe some of the limitations of the data. And then on this data, we've done cost for papers, and we, when papers examine impacts on women on firms and so on, they tend to be chosen for uh, financing and publication. And we also conducted a series of qualitative studies of which the Lashley study is one in 2018, okay? And there are two others. One is like examining how race also impacts women-owned businesses in the Caribbean. And the other one is kind of like the difference between demand for services and supply of services in Barbados, particularly in, in that case. Uh, so the, the first thing I'm going to do is kind of like give you a flavor of, you know, how, what is the gender composition of firm ownership in the Caribbean? And that comes from the data of the, of the last, of the surveys, but I'm going to focus on the last one, which is the most recent one, right? And what's important to note is that women-owned businesses are a minority in the population of businesses in the Caribbean. They average around 20%. Okay, and although there are different definitions for ownership, because you can have all women owned firms so that all the owners are female, you can have predominantly women owned where 50% uh, between 51% and 99% is owned by females, you have equal men and women ownership and then you have predominantly men ownership or all men ownership right? But when you sum like all female owned or predominantly female owned, it's around a 20% of Caribbean businesses, which means that predominantly um, businesses are owned by men, right? Uh, there are differences and variations between countries and the, the countries with most female ownership are Belize, Jamaica, and the Bahamas, the ones with least 
female ownership, Barbados, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, and Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. And uh, these women-owned firms tend to be concentrated in the, uh, in the services sector, and particularly in food, um, hotels and restaurants, uh, fashion, beauty, those types of industries, right? Uh, there's a correlation between size of the business and female ownership. So the larger the firm, the less likely that it's being owned by a female, and this difference is statistically significant, which really then, you know, within that finding, the research of Lashley and his colleagues is even more important because if there are statistically a significant difference, it means that there are some constraints that women-owned businesses face to growth. Uh, there's not a, a significant difference between the age of women-owned firms and, and men-owned firms. Uh, in export status, a, not a significant difference either in the sense that women-owned firms are about a quarter of the exporting businesses as a whole. So they more or less represent their proportion of the business population. What's really important, and I think this speaks about like why are women-owned businesses also so important to gender, is that uh, businesses that are led by women employ a larger share of women, okay? And this difference is statistically significant. So if we're interested in gender in, in general, we do want to like, we, care about the plight of women owned and women led businesses right and under the sdg of gender equality this issue of what are the assets that are controlled by women is super important and a, a business being a super important asset right so now let's go to the findings of lashley and his colleagues a, a, they a conducted qualitative research on a group of women owned businesses that went through a government of Canada funded World Bank project called InfoDev. Uh, you may have re uh, remembered that project. It was active between roughly 2011 and 2016. And as part of the project, there was a women incubators network. Okay, so that catered to 60 women who entered the program and exited the program. And the novel contribution of Lashley and his colleagues is that they conducted a survey of what were these women's constraints at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program. That's called a tracer survey. And they also complemented the, the surveys with interviews. Uh, they interviewed about half of the women uh, owned businesses. So that's like very significant, right? They were motivated because, you know, there was already research in the Caribbean that said that uh, women owned businesses tended to be smaller, as I said, that they were less productive. I hadn't shared that with you, but certainly there is evidence that they are less productive, less profitable, maybe because of the sectors that they occupy, which are a lot more, uh, there's a lot more competition than in other sectors. Uh, they operate these sectors that are filled with very small enterprises and usually, you know, don't use a lot of technology. Uh, the sectors are very low in the intensiveness of use of knowledge and have lower survival, survival rates. And then also, you know, this uh, um, research that had demonstrated that they were less likely to demand and to access credit. Uh, in fact, Lashley, in a previous research, he had seen that gender was a causal factor in restricting access to finance by these women-owned firms. Uh, and, you know, and uh, literature that said that the women-owned businesses were more risk-averse, more growth-averse, uh, with many factors coming into play for these um, aversiveness, right? And what they wanted to see in this difference between these 60 businesses that entered and that exited this program is, you know, do the constraints that they face change over time, right? Uh, with the program presumably having had an impact, right? So um, they categorize the businesses into growing. So between the beginning of the program and at the end, the, they had grown in employment, non-growing, so they had remained stable in employment and, or had even declined in employment. And um, the businesses were distributed 
almost half and half. So half had grown and half had remained the same or they had declined, right? And in fact, he did find a difference in like the constraints that each type of business uh, uh, confronted, right? Those businesses, first of all, related to trade, and I think this is super important, those businesses that had expanded in employment had also been able to expand their market reach. So uh, in terms of the nexus between trade and growth, right? And that those that had not expanded employment, there were also no differences in their market reach. What about the constraints? So access to growth financing was a constraint across the board for all businesses, but those that were growing cited it in a, less frequently than the others. Even so, half of those that were growing said that it was an important constraint, but like two thirds of those that were stable or non-growing cited it as a, as a very important constraint. And access to skilled staff was also a very important constraint. I have to say, we find in these surveys that access to skilled staff is a constraint across the board. It's not only um, specific to women-owned businesses. Um, then for those that did not grow, access to support services continued to be a constraint. Like they needed support services in order to grow. Uh, in those that declined employment, regulations like customs or things like lack of space, tax rate were significant challenges for those that were contracting. Um, access to markets, were super important for those that were growing or even those that remained the same. Uh, and lack of networking opportunities or lack of technology was important to those that were growing, okay, as top constraints. Um, so what did the business complain about in terms of accessing markets? They said, you know, what we really need is information on markets and information about uh, suppliers, right? So suppliers to my business, maybe from overseas, and how do I get into these markets? Or what are these markets demanding, right? And they also cited that they lacked skills internally with respect to how to market and export. And because these businesses operate in these very competitive spaces, this ability to really differentiate the product is super important. And one could think about policy recommendations in that regard, right? Um, a, this issue about risk aversiveness or a growth aver aversiveness, for sure they encountered some gendered behavior when they interviewed the businesses. Like a lot of them felt so responsible both for their families and for the well being of their staff and of their employees that they didn't take decisions that would place them at risk, even if those decisions meant further growth. Okay. And this issue about having to spend time caring for the family also took away from the time that they could dedicate to make this business grow. Lack of self-confidence, uh, which we hear often kind of like in this comparison between uh, women and men, and we hear it you know, across the board, uh, was also something that they um, cited. Um, I wanted to, to give you like from another study, access to growth financing, and this study really examined our 2020 data set so that you can see how, even though financing is, I'm done. I reached 10 minutes. We're Jan, done 10 minutes, but what we can, can you hear me? What you can do is maybe park that for the Q&A. Yes, so we can we park that. So I can give you a yes. few tips on like growth financing, digital technology use and innovation, but that can come later. Great. Great. And anything you want to add, please put in the chat. That was an excellent, really excellent overview and much needed just to understand what we're talking about before we get some of the other perspectives. So Sylvia, excellent way of opening the session. Um, and I'm gonna go quickly to our next speaker who I know has to leave before the top of the hour. So Gail Gollop um, is going to give the perspectives of UN Women, um, the multi-country office. And Gail is actually the national private sector specialist at UN Women having worked in this area of development uh, for over 15 years. And those of us in trade know her also 
uh, because she worked uh, prior to that at Caribbean Export um, and also has worked as special advisor um, at other places like PAHO and the IDB in Washington. So I know um, you have to run off quickly, Gail. So can you provide some perspectives of what you and women, their work program entails for improving competitiveness of women entrepreneurs um, in the region? Sure, thank you, Janice, and good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to first thank the Shreda Afram Fellow Center for inviting UN women to be part of this very important panel, as well as to congratulate Ambassador Matherin, who the name has been, as soon as I came into the arena, you know, you hear about Ambassador, Ambassador Matherin, so it's, it's really good to see her being recognized at this time. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about UN women and what we're doing our part. Um, Sylvia gave a very good overview of the constraints that are faced by women entrepreneurs. Um, so UN Women, just a little bit about UN Women itself, first of all. UN Women multi-country office in the Caribbean. We cover the entire region, 22 countries and territories from as far north as Bermuda, East um, Barbados, of course, to the West, Belize, and to the South, Guyana and Suriname. Um, of course, our overarching mandate is to achieve gender equality, the empowerment of all women and girls, and the fulfillment of their human rights. So as it pertains to this area, we are looking at our long-term result or impact is expected to be women's economic empowerment. That's what we um, are trying to achieve through this work, overall women's um, economic empowerment. So by doing this, um, we, right now, UN Women is focused basically on two wider programs to achieve this um, economic empowerment. The first is on the Global Affairs Canada, Government of Canada funded Build Back Equal program, which is for the, um, for, for countries in the OECS, only Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, under this project, it's built on four, um, three, the rationale behind this project is three principles. We recognize, everyone here recognizes that in the Caribbean, there is a need for a comprehensive approach to women's economic resilience, as we see. Gender inequality puts women at a disadvantage in society. And in order to achieve all the SDGs, women's economic resilience must be secured. And we plan to do this by reducing the barriers to women's economic empowerment through increased sustainable opportunities for women's growth and economic growth. So under this um, Build Back Equal project, um, we're partnering with UNFPA, the duration is four years, um, and the key actions, um, are in a couple, we have four, no, sorry, eight priority areas, law and policy, improving women's access to finance, improving women's business skills, increased access to gender responsive social protection, stock, shock responsive GBV, gender-based violence referral pathways, and social protection services, as well as capacity building of government entities increased ability of government and CSO to provide GBV services as well as strengthening family planning. So you might kind of wonder why we're, you know, the space of UN women and why I mentioned gender-based violence, et cetera. In order to achieve women's economic empowerment, we cannot do this in a vacuum. Therefore, an agency such as UN Women, from where we sit, we are trying to not just focus on entrepreneurs and building their capacity in areas, the areas um, highlighted by Sylvia earlier. We know they need strengthening um, access to finance, strengthening their management capabilities, et cetera. But from, UN, from where UN Women sits, we also recognize that a holistic approach is needed. Therefore, under this BBE project, we will look at relieving the unpaid care burden. We, we've seen this a lot in the last 
three years and through the COVID pandemic, the unpaid care burden, which has always been around, we have seen more child care through fle um, flexible working hours. Women are normally the primary caregivers in most, most households. So along with relieving the unpaid care burden under the project, we also want to increase access to sexual and reproductive health and rights services. Again, nothing can be done in a vacuum in dealing with women entrepreneurs. We have to acknowledge and and respond to all these areas that women that affect women entrepreneurs. And the third pillar that we're thematic area is the increased access to innovative financing. Um, we know we cannot do it all. It's a four-year four-year project, and so we have chosen to focus on increasing access to innovative financing, building the women entrepreneurs' capacities in so that they can access this innovative financing making them more competitive and therefore being able to access the trade agreements that Jani would have referred to earlier. Um, so UN Women focuses on these areas as well as the support of UN FPA in increased access to sexual and reproductive health and services. So um, what we have done, we have, built, we have partnered with Portland Private Equity who will, through another company in the Caribbean, provide um, financing, seek to provide financing to women entrepreneurs. We're looking at alternative methods of financing, not just the going to the banks or the going to the trade union, um, the trade um, credit unions, because we know that women entrepreneurs often find it hard to access finance in this way. But we we have this dedicated funding that we are building and building the capacity of these women in order to access. So the, uh, the ultimate outcome of the program is to improve economic and social equity equality for women and girls in the targeted Caribbean countries, including for marginalized or vulnerable women and girls. The, another project that we are currently looking at in this area is funded by the Joint SDG Fund Initiative. And this is titled Building Back Equal Through Innovative Financing for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. So this project is also a, um, a joint project with three other UN agencies, UNDP, UNESCO, as well as FAO, and it's for the benefit of countries, um, Bermuda and Bahamas. Um, which are pretty new, Bermuda for sure, is a pretty new country that we are working with in the um, region. And it's, and it's actually a very, it's very exciting because it's interesting. When we were applying for the funding, everyone always said, we got back the question many times, but why Bermuda? Bermuda has, you know, high per capita income, et cetera. But when you go on the ground in Bermuda, you will realize that the women entrepreneurs in Bermuda are facing the same um, issues as the women entrepreneurs in the entire region. Therefore, just because they have that high per capita income does not mean that the entrepreneurs on the ground, the women entrepreneurs, the, want, the sole entrepreneurs do not have the same issues. So under this project, we have three areas. Access to finance through the same financing vehicle that we spoke of just, I spoke of just now in relation to Portland Private Equity and the company which they're setting up. We will provide the technical assistance and capacity building, which will enable these women entrepreneurs to reach their goals, to be able to better um, absorb these funds into their, into their businesses, making them more competitive, as we also want to develop best practices, impact management, and all the lessons learned so that on this small scale project, it's only two years, can be scaled up to other, other countries in the region. So right now, those are the two wider projects that we're working on in the region. However, we, we realize that we know that we build the capacity again, the access to finance, um, access, you know, improved management, access to markets, et cetera. One of the things that UN Women is also looking at is to improve in, some people refer to it as the soft skills, but our women entrepreneurs are also suffering in projecting themselves as leaders and in their networking skills. 
So through our Afro-descendant project, we also want to give them guidance, give them um, have a self-built corporation. We had recently had an event where we invited participants from Latin America as well. And we actually have speakers from, from um, Nigeria who spoke about leadership and networking. And, and the women entrepreneurs were very grateful because they don't necessarily think of those things or those things are not necessarily offered to them. They think that we just have to make the business look good. We just have to get a good business and everything will go fine. But if the women do not have these skills, networking, leadership, et cetera, and build those networks, unfortunately, they're not going to go any further. I just want to touch on one more area before I finish. Um, underpinning all our work at um, UN Women as, as it relates to women's economic empowerment, we speak of the women's empowerment principles which is a framework which was developed by UN Women as well as in cooperation with Global Compact, the WEPS. So you, these principles, there's seven principles, and what we are trying to do in the region is not only encourage women entrepreneurs, but encourage all companies to sign on to the WEPS as it, as it shows an intention of the, com of the companies, of the women entrepreneurs, of any entrepreneurs, of any company, of the importance of gender equality, the importance of acknowledging the, the, um, the contribution of women in the workplace. Um, and just briefly, there are the seven principles established when the CEOs of companies and, and in the Caribbean, we have companies such as Flow in Jamaica who have signed on, Portland Private Equity has signed on, um, Nestle in Jamaica, and we have companies in Guyana who've also signed on and we're working through the region within these companies so that, so that when they sign on to these webs, they think of things such as um, high level corporate leadership for gender equality, treating all women and men fairly at work, ensuring the health and safety and well-being of all women and men workers, promoting the education, training and professional development for women, as well as implementing enterprise development, supply chain and marketing practices that empower women, promoting equality through community initiatives and advocacy as well, and me measuring this, as I'm sure um, Compete Caribbean um, would know from the study data, we don't have any data. So we think it's important that we measure and publicly report on the progress that these companies are making towards achieving the gender equality. Um, so that's just a brief overview of what we at um, UN Women have been doing and our contribution to, to um, the competitiveness of women entrepreneurs and, and ensuring that we achieve the most that they, that they achieve what they can. Um, as so in the end, the ultimate goal through a session like this is to enable them to be competitive and access the trade agreements that we've signed on to in the region. Um, I will stop here. As Jenny said, I have to run off now. I'm so sorry. I, I would like to stay, um, but if you have any questions, if any get in contact with me, please, Jenny and most of the other people that I see can see right here on my screen right now um, can can get in contact with me. So thank you again, Jenny and Alicia and everyone at Shridaf Ramphal Center. Thank you. Thank you, that was excellent. Um, I see some, before you go, what might be useful if you don't mind in the chat function is just to provide your email address because there's some sure. people on the call who want to know how do we get this funding? How do we access it? And this is a great segue to our next speaker. So first of all, thank you so much for waking up early. I know you're overseas on travel and all our best to you, you and women, Tony, for all the great work you're doing to build a capacity in order to pro project the women into these spaces. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I really want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A. So I'm going to ask our next speakers to really be tight with the time. Um, but it's a really great segue. This question of who's accessing it, these women entrepreneurs, are they accessing this? Are they able to access all these opportunities? What are the challenges they're facing? And it's my pleasure to have an actual entrepreneur in the room. 
Uh, Ms. Kim Butcher, who is tenacious, passionate, and determined. Uh, she's the founder of and um, creative director beside, behind the lifestyle brand Okoi by Kim, and I'm wearing one of the belts um, that she has uh, wonderfully um, created. It's, the brand is more than just the product. It's about empowering women to celebrate themselves and encourage them to live their life with purpose. Um, and she uh, works really in the space, the small business space, um, of these reversible belts as, as, as accessories to, um, to women's wear. But she also uses her voice. I know through a television series in Barbados called Buy From About Hair, About Hate, which is an original content series. So um, it's really great to have you and your voice here, Kim. I want you to tackle some of these questions especially from the ground and what's happening, where, where are digital opportunities, what's not happening. So over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. I am the person on the ground. I am the woman entrepreneur in the trenches. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me in the previous um, conversations. But first I wanna say thank you for this opportunity. Time and peace of mind as a micro entrepreneur are the two things that really resonate with us as women in business. The reason why we are risk averse and we self select out of funding or taking risk is because we have a lot to lose. Um, as female entrepreneurs, um, when we take the risk, we understand that it's our family that is also taking that risk. When men take a risk in business, they will still go home to a meal and their clothes and all these different things that we provide. But when women take risk in business, we understand fundamentally that we are holding up the family. So in, in a lot of instances where I would be more aggressive in my approach to business, a lot of women contemporaries, they just aren't because they understand what is really ultimately at risk. So I'm really glad that Compete Caribbean and UN Women um, understand that time and peace of mind are important. And the notion of innovative financing. And when I heard that conversation, I was like, okay, so how does innovative financing relate to me? Because ultimately, my, ex, my lived experience is that I am always able to access only a little bit of financing to get me to the next step. I can't grow exponentially with what I have access to based on where I am in business. And Okoye started in 2020. We are a response to what we saw happening in the environment. So vulnerable in the Caribbean for us in Barbados wasn't just people who um, fit into a bra one bracket. Vulnerable for us were persons who were middle class and who were doing other jobs, but they were materially impacted by COVID, which we're all still suffering and challenging through. But because education is where we, where we live, entrepreneurship wasn't an immediate next step. So what our brand is was looking to do was to encourage people to look at their passions, turn them into purpose, and then into profits. So when we think about innovative financing, we want to know how is it going to be innovative for us? People who weren't traditionally um, business-minded, who had to not just pivot, they had to go and do a whole ballet because now it's about survival. So I'm really interested to hear more about how financing will address some of our needs. The other thing uh, that I wanted to talk about briefly, because I know time is of the essence, <clears throat> is how I am using technology in my business to not just engage with Barbadians, but engage across the region. So um, you mentioned the television series, Buy From Bohe, and that was really a carrying call to encourage people to buy and support local local Barbadian artisan high quality products and services. And I want to be able to take Buy From Bohe across the region. So we're encouraging people to buy and support things that are produced in this part of the world. 
the other thing that I want to be able to see is our ability to tell our story. People talk about the soft skills and the leadership and negotiation, but it's really ultimately storytelling. Our women don't know how to tell stories because we don't tell them that's what it is. We tell them that they need to learn a number of different things, but we don't tell them to tell their authentic story. Why did you start your business? It's not a pitch, it's a story. And that's what the world is buying. And we in the Caribbean have unique stories of passion, how we turn these things into purpose and profits. So these are some of the things that really and truly resonate with me. And I do use social media tremendously to even the playing field in a place where culturally we're very familiar. And in a, in a world where that familiarity isn't always embraced, uh, even the Me Too movement is a good example of how our familiarity can be problematic in business. I have sought to use um, the social media tools and networking to ensure that we have the types of conversations that we want to have without the familiarity that can sometimes happen when you are in Caribbean settings. Men do business over drinks and in social settings. You know, now there are going to be more women in business. I have found that by using my social media platforms, I'm able to reduce some of the unnecessary conversations that you have when you're a woman in business. I'm not sure how I am with time, <laughs> but you can let me know. You're like, you're so enthralling with your storytelling. I stopped looking at the time, but let's give you three more minutes. <laughs> okay, three more no minutes. problem. No problem. Um, the, one of the, the other things I want to mention now is the importance of collaboration as a micro entrepreneur and a business person. Um, this is an area where we have sought to be very intentional about growing our brand and building capacity. So looking at linkages with other um, like-minded entrepreneurs in Barbados and across the region, what we want to be able to see as small business persons is the data. There is a lack of data right now that we have access to. It's not that it doesn't exist, but we want to be able to easily access it on trends that are happening. My business is about um, celebrating yourself authentically. Are there studies on body dysmorphia in the Caribbean? How we see ourselves? There's a reason why my curated content reflects real women because a lot of people consume social media. It is where we now live and it is the mirror to how we consume and not just see ourselves, how we see others as well. I want to know if there are there is research that is being done that can help us make critical decisions or data-driven decision-making um, based on what the university may be doing, maybe what um, Caribbean Export is doing, what Compete Caribbean is doing, that people who are on the ground like me can easily access and say, okay, we want to be able to make certain decisions, but we want to know what the data is saying relative to this or to that. And I thought, um, Compete Caribbean, when you started to talk about the, the data, I was in hog heaven, literally, because I felt like this is the type of thing that I want my community to have access to. So I've said a, I've said a mouthful, so I'll pause there to take questions. Kim, thank you for that intervention. In fact, it was more than an intervention. It was so refreshing in this space of trade where we talk a lot about technicalities to hear what we're fighting for when we talk about women and trade. Um, and the storytelling um, is so key to what you're saying. I'm seeing a lot of support in the chat for what you're saying. And I think it's also so important to leverage not just the region, but the world. So you said you want to go regional, I think you should go global. Um, and, and I think what we're trying to do with trade and trade policy is not so much think about what provision is going to say what, but how do we harness in the region what you're saying and make sure that the trade agreements and policy do not serve as a constraint, but actually give you and others like you what you need to, to do well. And the last thing I would say is your data point. I think when we think of data, we're thinking about things like 
you know, what is, how many women are involved in trade, et cetera. But what the point you're making, which I think you made really well also, and really kudos to Compete Caribbean for the work they're doing, is to think about what are the business opportunities that that data will give women entrepreneurs like yourselves access to. Because women entrepreneurs, they also want to study the global trends. They want to situate themselves internationally. So I think you brought so much on the table for us to discuss. And before we do that, let me just thank you so much. And to all of our other speakers, it's just been fantastic this morning. Let me just pivot finally to Alison. Um, and Alison is no stranger to either the SRC or any um, of our, our webinars, but also on the, on the regional stage. Um, she is well-placed, I think, to, to bring this home and look at not just um, what the women entrepreneurs are, say, are saying because of her work at Caribbean Export, but also tie it to what's happening really more generally in terms of global trends and what is her organization at Caribbean Export doing to promote that in that trade space. So she serves, just by way of her bio, as a services specialist at Caribbean Export Development Agency or CEDA. And uh, that agency's task is really to address the sector development of the region. And she looks at services um, and a whole spectrum of the work they do covers financial, creative education, spa and wellness services. So over to you, Alison. Well, thank you. Thank you very much on all protocols being observed and good afternoon to, to everyone on behalf of Caribbean Export. I'm really pleased to be part of this um, esteemed panel this afternoon and importantly to be part of this award to Ambassador Mathewin, whom I've worked with in many ways, but um, particularly in our negotiations of the CARICOM Canada Agreement. And I think, you know, I want to applaud her and this is a, a well-deserved award and thank the SRC for recognizing um. Now, you know, several great points were, were, were made earlier. And, you know, when we were developing the, 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 the panelists and the, the whole uh, intervention, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, Johnny asked me to speak to about trade agreements and, and women, but as you alluded to in your intro introduction, we don't see the specific reference to women in trade agreements. And I say trade is a, a tool to development. And I don't think that should be a hurdle or a hindrance or a block to us involving and including women in terms of our implementation of our trade agreements. And I will also say kudos to the, to, to, to the European Union in particular on our economic partnership agreement and implementation there, where to a large extent in, in um, Caribbean exports um, work um, on our 11th EDF regional private sector development program. We know that one of the key areas that was always required of us is to ensure that we include women in terms of how we, we implement and how we develop and uh, the projects. And I'll say that, you know, over the years, um, fortunately, we see at least 52% of the beneficiaries of the, the actions of Caribbean export has been women. But I think, you know, based on the study that was done by um, IDB and, you know, thank you very much for that, Dr. Dohart. And, um, you know, what Kim has, has stated is that we need to, as we go forward in terms of from a trade perspective and deal with issues of, of, of market access and try to change that whole narrative where women in trade is concerned. And in, in terms of the team that we now have today with Digit All, we need to look at how we approach trade. And I think looking at more knowledge intensive services, more knowledge intensive um, industries as such, you know, how we develop our programs. We speak of the issue of access to finance, and we know that there are a lot of resources out there. It's not, not about accessing the finance, but how do we access the finance in terms of the programs and the projects that we develop? So taking a step back, working with women to develop the programs and the projects that we can actually take to the bank, take to the funding agencies so that we can get access or get um, be able to have the financing. Because we also have to respect on both sides, there, there is risk involved for the lenders, especially the traditional lenders in terms of the banking sector. And we also have to understand that. So it's not that we should give up everything. And, and, and that's why we have to work with the women to ensure that the traditional, the non-traditional, or even from equity financing, et cetera, how the investment looks, how we develop the programs for the women so that they can actually, you know, be able to, to, to access the finance. And from the standpoint, really, in terms of this digital all and what women can do, I believe there's so much more that, that is available for us there that we do not see, but we need to talk more of. So Jan, probably we could have some more discussions. And when we discussed it on uh, women in trade, you know, we, we address some of it. Um, 
the basic issues. And I've seen in the study, women are more involved in, this, in the services sector. And I said, very good, not because I'm the services specialist, but the manufacturing sector cannot do without us. They can't, they can't progress without us. And so how can we develop the capacities of the women to address the manufacturing sector, which is also the backbone for our economies? How can we uh, develop the skill set of the women to address the agriculture sector and that's where ag tech comes in. And yes, you know, thank you very much for that, Kim. You know, we speak about the mindset that the women, women have when they go into the business and the, the responsibility, the risk, the responsibility. And that's where the services come in and where we can play a better and a bigger role as women that is very key to, to development. That's example in our research and development, in research and development services. Services auxiliary to agriculture, services auxiliary to our manufacturing, which is to, to knowledge intensive industries. So I, I'm not, I want us to change the view that women have to be in the, the lower scale. I believe women can play a greater role in the higher scale that attaches to that whole development dimension. And if we look at it that way, we talk about the green and the renewable energy. It's not about, the panels being on the roof where most of the men go up and install the panels. That's just the, that's just the hardware. What about the technology involved, the research involved in that, that we have to start to look at if we're talking about the digital and digitization and moving away from the, the, the way we do things. And I, I'm glad what Kim brought up in terms of the way she engages. And it, it's, we have to look at technology and the digital and digital for women in technology of itself, in terms of how we use technology in our product and processing methods, as well as how we use technology to get to that other level, to actually market and access, access the market. And that's where the issue of market intelligence comes in, market intelligence comes in. So we understand the markets. So we are not producing for like, but we are producing for demand. That's a basic economic theory. We produce what you demand. So for women to be able to understand that, and you know, just trying to bring it back around to, to what we're talking about and, and, and the trade agreements. Um, how do we then translate the implementation of our trade agreements to make sure we can develop these specific programs that can empower the women, whether it is from a technology standpoint, a digital standpoint, but empower women to actually be able to access the market and utilizing the tools that are out there. So from a Caribbean export standpoint, yes, we have our market intelligence tool, which I believe is very important and can really help. And I was actually had an opportunity to work with Kim, you know, to, to, to look at our market intelligence platform so that you can see who is demanding your product, what are the distributive um, arrangements, and, and these are things that we need to know. Also, understanding what are, the agree what are the requirements for trade. So you talk about exporting, and I, I'm glad, you know, in terms of what the study showed, the businesses that expanded, traded. So back to the point, market intelligence is really important. What is your export? How are, are you ready your export readiness? And once we are able to address that, diagnose the problems further, and many of them came out in, in the document and the study done by IDB, we can start to get down to the granular and fine tune programs in the implementation of what we are doing, whether it's here at Caribbean Export with our regional private sector development program, or, or a new program that's coming on the NDK, or other development programs to get down to the granular to work with the women to address these programs. And I would like to say, just in, in terms of, of, of wrapping up, that um, you know, uh, Kim made a point, and I, I want to highlight it really in, in terms of understanding your value chain. And as women, that you can't, we tend to want to do everything. And that's where the point that came out in what um, uh, the IDB, you know, Dr. Dohak said is that you need to, to have these business support organizations build their capacity to help the women because women try to do everything, but we can't do everything. And if we understand our value chain and we get that support, we could, you know, we could then better put our, our energies where we will get the impact. So where do you fit? Are you the creative? Are you the creative aspect? You know, we need our legal people to get you into the market. We need our marketing um, persons to help us. So a very good um, um, point that was made in that study, and I think we need to probably focus a bit of our attention there, where we build the capacity of our business support organizations to be able to support the women in trade so that they can actually access the markets. So in, in closing, I say, you know, um, once again, thank you for what has been done with, with IDB study. Thank you, Kim, for bringing it in together. But I believe that in what we have done at Caribbean Export and as we go forward in, in, in um, implementation, um, completion of our regional private sector development program and moving into our NDK program, we have to really and truly hone in on what it is that is necessary for the women. And it's not just about women participating in in an in, in in activity but to ensure that in their participation, it really and truly results in some impact or some change 
for those women in terms of access in the market, because it's all well and good to say that we have women participants, but I think we need to get down to the granular and to ensure that it really impacts the women and the children, because there's so many ways and avenues that I could continue to go on, but I, I will leave um, room for, for further questions and possibly have a further discussion. Thank you very much. Alison, and thank you for landing the plane and doing it on time with your remarks and bringing everything together so wonderfully. Um, I, I don't even know where to start with your presentation because I think one of the, at least one of the points that you raised, which is the need for um, business support organizations, um, not just in terms of what you do at Caribbean Export, which is to look at markets. And Kim, that's a really good resource also for you to identify market potential. Um, for the region and ITC also does quite a bit of work here, um, but also advocacy support and here I have to put in a plug again for the Caribbean women in trade and I'd ask everybody on this call, whether you're female or male, to actually go on to the Caribbean women in trade Facebook account and sign up because there is an enabling support network that we have to build around women and women entrepreneurs and also women trade policy. Uh, persons and also women, young women who are doing uh, research in this field and men as well. So it's not it's not exclusive, but it's another avenue for building the support that is necessary to propel women into these spaces. So great job, all of my panelists uh, for doing what we asked you to do when we conceptualize this, this session. We have about 10 minutes to open the floor to anyone who would like to make any remarks, ask any questions, and again, male or female, any reactions to anything our panelists have said, any ideas for bringing this work program forward in, in work you're doing, whether it's research or whether you're actually on the ground. Um, I wonder, I'm looking in the Q&A, I see a lot of, well, in the chat function, a lot of great jobs to our panelists. A lot of uh, kudos for the work that's being done also um, by uh, Compete Caribbean, um, you and women as well. And I know Caribbean Export is also doing a lot of work and hopefully will revitalize what was a we export. Um, so I think unless there are any questions or comments, maybe Sylvia, you wanted to present some more um, findings of the research you've been conducted, but I, I don't want to uh, prevent anyone from making any more questions, but comments or making questions. We have about five minutes left. Um, questions, comments from the floor. So maybe Sylvia, maybe two minutes to present what you wanted to. At okay. The In terms of access to finance, uh, you know, which has been discussed by all the amazing panelists uh, today, um, so I put a, a link in the chat, but I'll just give you like a big picture summary uh, where in the last 20 years, like women owned businesses in the Caribbean for short term loans, they've been accessing roughly the volume that the men owned businesses access. But for long term loans or medium term, they only access a, so one point four percent of the total volume of loans to Caribbean businesses. Imagine when they are 20 percent of the Caribbean businesses and the differences like the average size of those loans and so on of the medium and long term loans are one tenth of the average size of the loans given to men owned businesses. And this difference cannot be understood by differences in size of the businesses alone. So I think there's a lot to do in access to finance uh, in terms of you know, how financiers look at women-owned businesses, uh, their prospects for growth, the entrepreneurs themselves, et cetera. It's a super important point. And Alison made a great point. I mean, just a, a little anecdote on green technology, because this is going to be, like I have others on digital innovation, won't tell you here, uh, I'll just, send you papers as they come out, <laughs> Janice, and you can distribute through the network. But we found for adoption of environmental, like climate mitigation or adaptation technology, that women uh, adapt those like at 5% the rate of men owned businesses. That's something to, to think about as well. Of 
you Kim's comment that we can't take big risks with small financing. So, and, and this is, I think this is such an important point. Like is, what is the available financing that is being offered to women? Um, big, I mean, big financing um, envelopes or do we, even if we do provide them, we can take, yes, women are getting more financing. Are we taking risks on them? And this is not necessarily to you, Sylvia or Allison, you're not the bankers and the gatekeepers, but do you have any ideas um, or anyone else in the chat or anyone in this room on, on any of these questions? And then whilst you ponder that, Zinzi is asking, by any chance has anyone looked at gender disparities um, on the impact of natural disasters in recovery? I know you did some work, Sylvia, on, on COVID, but what about natural disasters? Also, climate change, women and climate change. Um, these are huge, huge impacts. And then just to say also, Jennifer Nugent Hill has said that our Caribbean women need a network of champions, including men who have controlled the financial apparatus for a long time. Um, and just if I'm missing anyone else's comments, um, just also P.I. Gomes is extending congratulations to you, Ambassador. Um, for your well-deserved recognition. Um, and White Smoke says, well done and long life. Regards, P.I. Gomes. Um, so just, um, yes, go ahead, Kim. You have something to say? Um, the, the point that I was making is that what, what I'm finding at, our, at my level is that we are using more AI to build resiliency in our business. So we are using a lot of the artificial intelligence tools to support any knowledge gaps that we have in our businesses. And that is a growing trend for women entrepreneurs because we have access to the technology, we are using it. And I find women are adapting a lot quicker to the use of AI in their businesses at my level um, compared to my male counterparts. And that's what we're using to kind of bridge the gaps that, that we have. Great, great idea there. Two questions I missed and we'll end and anyone who wants to answer anything I mentioned before. And these two questions by Regina Thomas. Uh, well, Regina actually asked, she says it was repeating. Why do women, why do we think women find it hard to access funding for their businesses? Again, maybe that's from the research or from your experience, Alison. And then also, I think this is a really great way to end. What do you think has to be done, especially in the business community, to encourage more institutions to take a risk on women? <laughs> Million dollar question. So um, let's each uh, ask each of our panelists to wrap up with these thoughts or any other thoughts they have, um, starting maybe with you, Allison. Hey, thank you very much. Um, as I said, in terms of um, the funding, um, why they had to access the funding is in terms of the, the programs, the projects sometimes that are developed, uh, they, they do not present um, properly uh, what is the idea. So we need to look at more of business planning and, and, and writing to, to help the women and to make sure that they have their records in place because um, very often the banks uh, you know, ask for, for records. So if they do not have their records, the project is not properly structured. They have the difficulty in accessing the finance. So we have to look at these um, steps that are required and, and work on it. You asked a million dollar question because I have faced it, you know, trying to, to also get a, um, uh, a funding for 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 some other issues and they're like you know you're you're if you if you're doing consultant services they want a value they want assets and when you have services how do you value intellectual property these are things we need to look at so um in, in business community how do we encourage more institutions to take risks on women i think they need to 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 go back to to looking at you know how women um not notwithstanding that the study speaks to to, to women and, and some of the failures in the business we also need to look at women would also be the ones to really sit down and make sure a business work because of the risks they understand involved if a business fails so using a spin it around on on, on, the, on the on the head i um, mean taking it into consideration what kim said as, as a business person because of the, the risk involved that if you lose the, the amount that you have to lose you are likely to more likely than and someone else to really try to make that business work and so so we have to, it has to be a constant mindset change that as women, we can do it. 
over to you, uh, Cynthia, and then Kim. Yeah, no, I was going to say that um, in terms of, you know, how do you get more access to finance from women, uh, coincide with Alison's point, sometimes it's like an objective reading of the women-owned businesses' financial position, because we said that they operate in sectors that are more competitive, smaller profitability, and so on. But indeed, some of our research also indicates that when they go to the bank, like the bank is like, let me talk to the business owner. And they're like, I'm the business owner, like not expecting that it's a woman, okay? Uh, so I think both issues need to be there. In terms of risk financing, this study has not been made in the Caribbean, but certainly in the US, you see that like venture capital panels, when they're more balanced in gender, they will tend to uh, better assess the risk of um, investing in a women-led business. When it's all men, you see a disproportionate, like smaller size, or, or less women-owned businesses financed uh, that are as attractive as like men men-owned businesses. And certainly, the the women that participated in the in the study of Lashley and and colleagues uh, cited something that Kim said: like we want networks with people that are business-minded, that are both men and women, that support each other, like to share information and grow together. I think that's a super important point. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm ahead. Ahead. Um, I actually wanted to close by saying it's a matter of changing a culture. Um, the persons who manage financial institutions, banks, credit unions, etc., they don't see that they're managing their risk, and we understand that. But we don't have a culture of being able to fail forward. And I think the more we see stories of success and we see stories of people failing forward, that it'll give financial institutions a little bit more of an appetite for engaging with us as women entrepreneurs or as just entrepreneurs in general. Um, the, the battle will be a little bit different if you can see, which is why programming is important, people being able to see what we are actually doing on the ground, how hard it is that we're working. The paperwork is important, and good on paper is one thing, but we need to have a culture now of understanding that, you know, in the Caribbean, people will have to fail forward. And I think that's where brands like mine, in terms of telling stories and showing what it is that we're doing, give people a little bit more confidence that they can invest in us because an investment in a woman is an investment in the future. So I don't know how to better close it, let me just spontaneously, and it's so nice that we have so many people. Thank you, panelists, for what was a great performance on this topic. It was wonderful. It was personal. It was research-driven. It was passionate. It was informed by experience and technical know-how. And I think uh, both yourselves here and Gail, who had to leave us, really did us proud as women um, in Latin America and the Caribbean. I, mean, I know, uh, Sylvia, you're, you're now a Caribbean woman. You've been here long enough, but I know you're- I'm from Venezuela, from which has a Caribbean- There you go. <laughs> there you go. So thank you all for, for doing justice to this theme. I also wanted to mention before that there were other kudos to Ambassador Master, and this was the first part of you join us late. The first part of this event was recognizing and awarding Ambassador Gail Matron with the SRC, a prestigious SRC award for service in the area of trade. And I have from Matthew Wilson, Ambassador Matthew Wilson, kudos. I see other persons you've worked with in Geneva also on the chat. Um, and as I mentioned, PI Gomes and others who have expressed sincere um uh, congratulations in this forum and others so that's over to you and i see i missed some questions nick sorry from maxine mclean also who's talking about work that um barbados is doing in youth in business youth entrepreneurship schemes etc posing some really great questions that we didn't get to but hopefully um were touched on by the participants and the panelists um, so without further ado, I'm going to bring this wonderful session to a close and let me in the process thank all of those responsible for making this a success. 
Ambassador uh, McCook, thank you for your gracious and wonderful words on behalf of your team and as well as the board um, and the, com the community in the Caribbean for thanking Ambassador um, for her contribution. And I know a generous offer of lunch awaits us <laughs> to, to actually celebrate Ambassador. Let me also thank the team here at the SRC, Alicia, who helped with the conceptualizing, um, to Neil Clausel, Des, Andre, all of those who worked behind the scenes to make sure the place looks lovely. So thank you. Let me also thank the IT team who is on my left here. You cannot see them, the UEIT team, Sam, uh, Jason, and the, 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 the person. <laughs> Holland, Rondell, exactly, and others who keep supporting the SRC for all the work that we do. Uh, let me also thank the persons present here, uh, the OTN, now the SMT, CSMT, CSMT team, CSMT team um, who were here. It's hard for me to pronounce it, but basically CARICOM Secretariat yes. team. Yes. Uh, you can't yes. see all of them. Okay. We have Leo over here, Titus uh, uh, Privil as well, and Ambassador. And of course, to our awardee, Oh, Ambassador Master, thank you for your graciousness in accepting our award. And to the panelists, the audience, this has been a very heartwarming session. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to you continuing to support women in trade uh, and all the efforts in that area and the SRC. Thank you all and enjoy your weekend and see you again soon. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, right, everyone. Congratulations again, Ambassador. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was great.